Um, Saint Severin is an interesting monument in many respects. I have quite a fondness for this monument, and um, let's get right into it. So Saint Severin was actually a saint in the um, fifth century, and when he died, he actually built a very famous um, abbey in Switzerland. And he became a saint when he died. There was a chapel built here on this site in the Latin Quarter, the fifth arrondissement. And uh, later on, the Vikings came through in the ninth century, and they pretty much wiped out all of the religious structures that Paris had. So the original chapel to Mr. saint Severin was destroyed by the Vikings, and uh, then they built the subsequent structures on this site. Notably, today, this is a medieval structure that is, um, started in the thir- was started in the 13th century, which that bell tower uh, comes from. 13th century bell tower. Now that bell tower and I have a, a particular relationship now. We had quite a, a bit of an experience together. And if you follow, if you can check out my blog and, and whatnot, some of you already know. Uh, the, the link to that will be in the description here. Great to see everybody here, 147 of you. Ah, Hungary is in the house. Fantastic. Thanks for, for watching from Hungary. So this is a church, saint Severin, straight up Gothic, uh, different periods of Gothic. So from the 13th century up through the 15th century, and during that 15th century, there was a style that is known as the flamboyant Gothic. Um, flamboyant in French, flamboyant, just means flaming. Uh, and you can see very distinct flames up there. And so the flamboyant style of Gothic always in- involved a flame motif. We're going to have a nice in-depth walk through saint Severin in a moment. Going to give my cell signal a good old test inside of that church. Hopefully we can all stay connected today. Oh, Norway's in the house as well. Hungary and Norway. I love it, I love it, I love it. Let me do the usual slip through of the gate here. Got just enough room to pop my equipment through. Eesh. Don't scratch the glass, Corey. Okay, good, we're inside. saint Severin has a very unique part of very old world Paris, medieval Paris. Uh, it's this, it used to be an old cloister and uh, a burial ground. And the, the arcades that you see there to the south of the church are called, uh, in French they call them charnier, I believe, but they're called char- uh, charnel houses. And they were used to stack the bones and stack the remains from the graveyards. And so it's really the only example, to my knowledge, of those old charnel houses that you can find in Paris. This actually, this space, let me just give you the pan. When I moved here in 2010, this used to be open to the public. And I loved it. And people would go over there and they'd have little picnics. They'd grab their lunch, you know, the workers from nearby. I'll show you the gargoyles. And the, the workers would come, and I, I would as well, and you could grab a sandwich and just do your thing here. And I thought that was such a, a luxury in the Latin Quarter to be able to enjoy that. And then they closed it. They shut it down, probably because, you know, recent events, 2015 and whatnot. So that's what's going on there. Now, here's a random fact. You know, we love the facts that are, you know, the more obscure, the better. In 1474... This was the site of the very first gallstone operation. <laughs> and what, what they did, apparently, they took a soldier uh, who had committed a crime and was condemned to be hanged. And they said to the soldier, if you volunteer to be our guinea pig for this gallstone operation, sh- uh, should you survive, you will be pardoned and freed. And so that's exactly what happened. The soldier said, yeah, sure, go ahead, you know, cut me open. And the operation worked, and he was freed. So those are the old uh, charnel houses, those arcades where the bones would have been kept back in the day. Let me slip back through the, the grill here. Oh, actually, before we leave, got to keep my brain on point today because I got to mention too, what you cannot see is, legend has it, there's a subterranean network of tunnels underneath the Latin Quarter, in particular, underneath this little uh, section. And the tunnels were built by the, the Knights Templar back in the day, right? That medieval order of warrior monks uh, thought to have discovered the Holy Grail. And, uh, they dug tunnels under the Latin Quarter, and apparently later on the Freemasons would use those tunnels, and then the, the French revolutionaries would use them as well. And apparently the network will, will connect to, not too far from here, um, a jazz club. If you've ever been to the underground jazz club called Caveau de la Huchette, on Rue de la Huchette, uh, there's, a, there's a medieval cellar that you watch the shows in, the, the jazz performances. Apparently uh, that connects to this subterranean, legendary, mysterious network of tunnels. All right, now we can pop through the gate. And now we can get inside saint Severin. Dexterity test. Uh, uh, okay, we got it. Ellen Fry. My own mother in the house. Thanks, Mom. saint Severin is where we are today. Let's make our way inside. 
I did a test yesterday of the cell signal inside and it worked out fairly well. So if the gods are with us, with us today, then we should stay connected inside. And I hope that the quality will be up to your standards and up to mine as well. So sans fin, here we go, Latin Quarter. I think you know who she is. We'll talk about Mary inside and then uh, some lovely little details here. Mary Helms, a little late to the party. Don't worry, Mary. There's always the replay. Oh my goodness, we got swallowed up by one of those very inf infamous groups here. Excuse me. Okay, now I'm going to go into whisper mode because I don't want to bother anybody in this church. saint Severin. Again, as I mentioned at the start, this is a mixture of the 13th century bleeding into the 15th century as they expanded. There were fires, and then they needed the parish got too big, and then they needed to expand, and that was pretty common. So we're in the nave, the central corridor of these churches. Typically, the floor plan is in the shape of a crucifix of these churches. You may have heard that before, but this one is an anomaly. It doesn't have the transept that would cut across the nave to create the the cruciform shape of floor plan, so it's different for that reason. We'll talk more about the stained glass as we make our way through here. <laughs> I can see you're all appreciating the visuals here. I'm so glad. 13th century is when they started this, and if you look over here to the left, you can see the first three bays, or the first three sections of the nave, have those very, well, let's ad admit it, sort of simple and austere round pillars. So do you see that? The first three sections, and then it switches to 14th and 15th century, and you can see how the style was different. So we think of these, think of these uh, buildings as being just Gothic, right? Just lump, lump them all into the Gothic category. But they would take so darn long to build and to expand upon that you would have different architects and different styles that would come into fashion. And so, you know, Gothic is a is broad, broad stroke, but it's uh, lots of different styles within that. Still a functioning Roman Catholic church here. The bell tower is original from 13th century, and the original uh, entrance of saint Severin used to be right there at the base of the bell tower. Oh, Phyllis says the sound quality is excellent. Good. I've got my little pom-pom Phyllis attached to my mic, and I've got it right up against the old, uh, the old mouth there. So from the nave, when they expanded it, what they did was they created actually uh, five different corridors. So there's one, two, central one, three, four, and five over this way, two more corridors. And this one right here that we're in is actually called the collateral. And once again, 13th century original pillars, not too, too fancy, switching over to the more fancier flamboyant Gothic with the ribs. In fact, when they expanded the church this way to the south, made it wider essentially, let me show you what's going on up here. From this original style, see how it's it's ribbed? They're almost like three three ribs that make their way up. Let's follow this arch right here. Up, up, up to the vaulted ceiling and then all the way down. But when it comes down, the column, the style of the pillar itself actually changes. And the point right where it changed, they actually wanted to hide that fact, right? Do you see the difference between above the, those little sculptures and below? So the style was too abrupt or the shift was too abrupt. So at this point here on every pillar, they put these little uh, sculptures of monks and prophets. And the same thing happened over here as well. Let me show you that, if you can make that out. So sometimes architects are trying to hide the fact that two pieces of a building don't line up, that they don't match. <laughs> Missy Lamb, super fan Missy Lamb says she can almost smell that church smell. Hi, Missy got all of the super fans here today and I'm pretty excited. My goodness, we're going to have a good time here. 200 of you live with me. Saint-Severin, 5th arrondissement. And before we make our way all the way around and sort of break down the anatomy of this church, the stained glass that you see over there, a lot of that is from uh, 14th, 15th century up there. 
But over here, they redid a lot of the windows in the 19th century. And by the 19th century, I mean, the medieval age was long gone. They had really perfected the art of stained glass. And so what I like about this particular style of window is that the faces are extremely expressive. Let me pop into this chapel. It's, you really get that comic book effect. Expressive faces. In the back, you had architectural elements, you know, in the, in the backgrounds and um, pastoral scenes. Really good stuff. And then this, ooh, the paintings, also from the 19th century, so fairly modern by Paris standards. How gorgeous is that? Wow. And it just goes on and on and on like that in saint -Séphane. Speaking of these windows, something that really cracks me up. Of course, the church is always trying to fundraise, right? So if you're going to install these windows in the 1800s, you've got to find a, a pretty darn good way to pay for them. So what they did was they tapped all of these local families in Paris um, and, and contacted the very wealthy families and said, listen, if you're willing to donate to the to cause here, help us put these windows in, we'll actually put you in the story. So even though these are stories of the gospel and the lives of the saints, the, <laughs> the local Parisians of the 19th century, the wealthy ones, were allowed to be sort of injected into the scenes. And here is my favorite example of that. This is labeled uh, Christ blessing the children. So that's Christ there with the children. But if you look over here, I think some of you might get a kick out of this. Do you see over there on the left, there's a man with a halo? Well, there's a gentleman behind the haloed man kind of peeking through. That's the architect Charles Garnier, who did the famous Opera House of Paris, the, the Opera Garnier. And I'm sorry we can't get any closer, but isn't that fantastic? He was a benefactor and helped install these windows or help pay for the windows. And so they put Mr. Garnier, the architect of the opera house right there, sort of a peekaboo peek situation behind one of the saints. So here's Jesus, by the way, in the center. Um, Jesus blessing the children. Now, the face of Jesus, was it actually they go in for Jesus or was that just one of the wealthy husbands in, in the Latin Quarter who also helped pay for the windows? And are all of these people just locals? It makes you wonder. even though I'm excited. Yeah, Missy Lamb mentioned that that's the, the ultimate classic photo bomb of the architect slipping himself in the stained glass. This is a chapel that has an interesting surprise. Bones, relics. from a saint called St. Ursula. St. Ursula's remains were found once near the city of Cologne, or Cologne, and um, it became quite fashionable, actually, and popular to worship her remains. Well, they got moved over here to this church, probably because St. saint Vran, where we are, this church was the patron, or the, the parish church, rather, of the Sorbonne University nearby, the Latin Quarter, of course, being famous for medieval universities. And they adopted her, St. Ursula, as the, the patron saint of the Sorbonne University. So that's probably how these remains, the bones of Ursula, how they ended up here, the parish church of the students and the professors for that matter. Are they actually her bones? Well, when it comes to relics, they estimate that there were about 30 tons of religious relics in the Middle Ages. And that's a lot, 30 tons. They can't possibly all be legit. Let me show you this chapel. More beautiful paintings, 19th century. Nancy Moylan watching with her son and just told him to quiet down because we're in a church. I love it. That's good, Nancy. That shows that I'm uh, succeeding in giving you the, the feeling like you're here. Okay, so more paintings here. Gorgeous gospel, Bible, all that good stuff. This door is particularly nice, particularly nice. Let me show you that. And then also I want to explain something. This, a tradition called an ex voto. That's not it. That's a hinge of the door. But the ex votos were these marble plaques that were a way for the church again to raise money. And so parishioners, um, churchgoers would pay to have a thank you uh, message that they could in, have engraved in these marble plaques. And it's m op uh, most often thanking the Virgin Mary. So let me show you, for example. This one is here says, um, always protect and look over my, look after my child, right? That's legit. Over here, this one's really cute. This one says, 
marriage desired, marriage uh, realized, or marriage, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Marriage desired and marriage uh, executed or whatnot. It happened in 1904. But then you've also got tons of thank you for letting me pass my exams. Thank you for success in my exams. Thank you for success in my exams. And so it shows you that we were near the Sorbonne University and a lot of students who were obviously pretty stressed about their various exams. Um, I guess in France they take their education seriously enough that they'd have to pay good money to officially thank the Virgin Mary for that when they succeeded. The floors are nice here too. Hi Steph from Seattle. Signal's holding up so far. So far, so good. This mural here has seen better days, hasn't it? Looks like a Last Supper situation. All these chapels are dedicated to saints, and this is Francis of Assisi here. I'll show you the little statue. Laura West is asking what those plaques are. They're called Ex Votos, E X V O T O. Okay, here's a chapel dedicated to the patron saint of Paris, Saint Genevieve. Let me show you this gorgeous little hunk of art. You might recognize this from my photo I used for the announcement yesterday on Facebook. That's Genevieve. Next to a stunning 19th century painting once again. My goodness, the artists went crazy in this church for our enjoyment. And then here, of course, the window displays a key moment in the life of St. Genevieve, who protected Paris in many ways, notably against Attila the Hun, who was headed for Paris. And she prayed and prayed and prayed, and Attila the Hun mysteriously decided to not invade Paris in the end. So she gets credit for protecting the city from him. But here she is famously giving sight back to her blind mother. So I saw that my mom's watching this live video. Mom, I, I promise if you ever go blind, I will pull the St. Genevieve and make sure you get your eyesight back, because those are the kind of things that she was doing in Paris many hundreds of years ago. So that's Genevieve. Here, Saint-Severin switches it up glass-wise, and I'll explain that in a second. We've got some very abstract mid-20th century um, windows. Some like it, some don't. You can be the judge. This is a ch the Chapel of the Holy Sacrament. That was built then as, a, as an addition in the 1600s to the church. I don't want to talk in there because sometimes people are praying um, to the sacrament, but I want to mention that in the 1600s it was uh, built as an oval, as a side chapel, and that was very rare in the 1600s to have a completely round oval uh, chapel. And then also I'm going to show you the ceiling because in fact the shape, the floor plan of this uh, chapel intentionally follows the shape of an oyster shell, the um, or excuse me, a scallop shell. The scallop shell was the famous symbol of the famous pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela that you would do. Sometimes you start in Paris and you take this long pilgrimage by foot on foot all the way to Spain to pray to Saint Jacques or Saint James, and you would take you would bring back uh, traditionally a scallop shell. So let me show you very. It's very subtle, but there's the bottom of the scallop shell, right? And then it wraps around here. Oval. And it goes all the way around. And back down to the base, base of the shell. Hopefully you can make that out on the video. So that was pretty revolutionary to shape the chapel in the shape of that um, symbol of the pilgrimage. Santiago de Compostela. And then up there, I know it's very dark on the video, but those are sacred hearts, and so those are containers shaped like a heart, representing the heart of Christ, in the form of a crucifix, and they may actually have something inside of them, each of those little hearts. 
more abstract stained glass. Again, we'll get to that in a moment. This is sad. You know, you'll often see this in a church where it says to the, um, to the children of saint Severin that died for France in the First World War. So, sadly, a very long list here. 1914 through the end, 1918. Certainly one of the realities that all of these parishes had to deal with. Here we've got a chapel that, um, to my knowledge, is dedicated to the Blessed Virgin. And we can see here, this is 18th century. Quite a beauty. Let's just meditate on that for a second. Uh, and Anne Hill says amazing details. Thanks. You're very welcome, Anne. This actually made me chuckle the other day. Um, snakes often get a bad rap in religious paintings, and I'm quite happy about that because I'm not a fan of snakes. But I don't know, you might have to zoom in on this on your own, but um, here is a lady stepping on a snake, and maybe you can't make it out, but the eyes of the snake are bulging out, almost like a cartoon, like, Ugh. Again, I don't much like snakes, so I'm happy to see that. Okay, what's going on with the glass here? This was a 20th century artist called Bazen, Bazen, and he was commissioned to replace windows that needed replacing. And this is the 1960s, at the time when, as an artistic style, abstract expressionism was a big thing. In New York, New York City, you had Mark Rothko and Willem de Kooning, and the, you also had a Jackson Pollock over there in the States, and they're all doing these great abstract works in the mid-20th. And um, so he, he was kind of born out of that. These windows represent the seven sacraments, which I'm not an expert on, but the blue windows here represent water, and specifically the moment of the baptism of Christ. And so it's no, no mistake, really, or no surprise that there's a baptismal font, I'll show you right here, in this chapel in the rear. So baptismal font, the blue windows representing the water of the baptism. And there you go. You can let me know in the comments what you think about this, this stained glass. It's definitely an abrupt stylistic shift when you're moving from the other ones. Here's another detail too, just because we're going to get real nice and deep into saint Severin. Because this is the chapel of the Holy Virgin, you probably can't make it out, but up there that's called the keystone, where the X's cross over the vaulted ceilings. And on that keystone it says Ave, and then this one over here, the keystone, sorry. Keystone says Maria, so you've got Ave and Maria. You'll see that more, you know, more clearly if you ever come here in person. Okay, we're halfway through saint Severin, And my shoulder's tired, so maybe I'm going to switch hands here. There we go. So we're looking down the nave towards where we entered. That is the main rose window that faces out from the facade. You can see the altar here is a very modern looking, very um, minimal and sh shall I say classy crucifix. And the organ is back there too. We'll talk about the organ a little more in a minute. Now let me tell you, the, there's a, a great jewel that saint Severin is famous for here, a highlight in the back. It's a section that they call the obsidiary uh, chapels. Obsidial, sorry, obsidial chapels. So look at this forest of trees, very vegetal, vegetal um, very organic, right? It doesn't feel like limestone, but let me show you why medieval architecture is so brilliant. As you make your way towards the back of the church, towards that very famous or popular um, important chapel, look what happens to the columns. This one intentionally just round, a round plain pillar. From that, you move visually to this one. It's not only octagonal, but it's concave. From the concave octagonal, you move immediately to this one that is octagonal but then has ribs. So each one stylistically is different and it almost creates kind of a, a, a rhythm of suspense, right? Like boom, boom, boom. What, what's going to come next? What, what is this going to um, culminate as? And that it's, it's this right here. Let me show you. There's another one right there. And then all of a sudden the highlight happens here. This right here is the central pillar of the obsidial chapels and the ambulatory. And look at that, it actually, it's like almost as if it had twisted its way up. 
they believe it's meant to represent the tree of life from the Garden of Eden. And it's the only column like it in this church. It's really the only pillar, Gothic pillar like it in Paris. We take it for granted now, but this is all individual stones that had to be carved quite often by different stonemasons. And they had to follow precise measurements. You can see the joints here, right? Precise measurements so that all of these ribs matched up perfectly. So it's almost as if, let me come over here to this one. You, you do have some pillars that have the ribs. See that rib, rib, rib on all the corners? It's almost as if you took one of these in your hands and just twisted it to get that. So that is certainly one of the highlights of saint -Sivran. It's It's one of the things that makes it famous. And I always get the same sensation when I'm, when I'm around here in the back. I feel like I'm walking through a forest, a forest canopy. And then I found this just earlier today, so for fun, you know I'm a sucker for a good, good composition. So we've got one of these abstract windows from Mr. Bazin, that's from 1960. And then there is a holy water receptacle, right there if you can make it out. And if we have some fun, we can find the reflection of the window right there. Why not get a bit artsy? All right, let's continue. We're on the northern uh, side aisle now, the northern aisle. We've got a 17th century painting from the Baroque era. Let me try to reduce the glare. This is considered another treasure of the church. It's St. Paul. St. Paul is busy writing at his desk. And as you do, uh, he's got a sword here in his left hand just in case someone attacks him while he's uh, executing his, his literary session. So that's St. Paul, beautifully done. If you ever come here in person, make sure you pause here on the northern side aisle to enjoy St. Paul there, 17th century. And then we've also got an old tombstone. You remember at the start of this walk, I showed you those arcades, the charnel houses outside where they would keep the bones? Well, it w that was a burial plot, and they took one of these beautiful um, tombstones. It was actually a gentleman. He and his wife had 15 children. So let me get a little closer. That's what's happening here. 15 kids, all praying at the, the base of the crucifix. And then the inscription, beautifully carved inscription here, says in French that this tombstone was uh, transferred from the burial plot outside. Oh, this is great. 220 of you still live with me. It's fantastic. Let's walk into the nave again. Quite like that view. So altar to one side of us. And do you see that that twisted pillar that we talked about, the tree of life, as it were, is certainly highlighted visually behind the altar. Thanks for all the hearts and the thumbs up, folks. That actually helps, helps Facebook, uh, uh, it helps convince Facebook to share this video, actually. And the organ, right? The organ is from the 1700s. They do fire it up occasionally. And I know it's, it's quite backlit there, but you get the idea. This church is always overlooked. It's always dead quiet, and I love it for that. I love it. Same reason I like Saint-Sulpice and Saint-Germain. We got the triforium up there, so basically the ground floor, the triforium that we see there, and then above the high windows. While we're here, let me show you this. If it's not too dark, because I'm trying to give you a real nice thorough walk through here. This is a smaller organ keyboard, and I guess it is going to be too dark. Next time I'll bring my flashlight, but hopefully you can make that out a little bit. 
It's actually this beautiful uh, sort of pea green color, like a pea soup green. And uh, these lovely painted ladies and motifs and whatnot. You have to see that in person when you come through. All right, let's finish our walk here. This chapel has is dedicated to St. Teresa, and here's a statue of her, and this was designed by Landowski. You may not recognize that name, Landowski, but he famously did two things. Um, Christ the Redeemer in Rio de Janeiro, you know, that enormous statue of Christ with his arms outstretched. So that's the same artist. And then also here in Paris, he did, on the Pont de la Tournelle, he did the statue of St. Genevieve. That is tucked away there behind Notre Dame and Ile Saint-Louis. So he designed this little sculpture of uh, St. Teresa. If any of you out there, I'm seeing a lot of familiar names, but if anybody's new to this whole idea, this is episode number 36. We've been doing this since January of me live streaming through different parts of Paris. And I am a full-time tour guide and photographer and just absolutely in love with Paris. So you can join me here on my Facebook every week for a vicarious walk in real time through the city. And um, you can take tours with me. I'm a full-time tour guide. I think I mentioned that already, but I am. And you can contact me. The link's in the description here of the replay that'll go up on Facebook. And um, I meet people almost every day and take them on tours in person, show them all this stuff uh, so they can see it with their own eyes. We've got a 17th century sculpted piece of marble here, a sculpted relief. And this is actually Christ getting, let me zoom in, getting a little bit of a snip snip, if you know what I mean. That's what happens when you're Christ... Uh, there are no intimate moments. Everything is represented thousands and thousands of times in all of the artists' uh, various media. So that was the the um, circumcision of Christ. I, I guess you probably gleaned that already, that that's what was going on. And then this last chapel here is dedicated to St. Vincent de Paul. St. Vincent de Paul, this gentleman, lived in Paris in the 1600s. He has always seen, you can always rec recognize him in two ways, first of all. He always has quite a pretty good schnoz on him. He's got a good prominent nose, St. Vincent. And he's always got children. So you see the baby in his arms there. He is known as the protector of children because he created many charitable organizations in Paris and it literally saved children from the streets. Orphans and abandoned kids and whatnot. And so not only do we have the statue of him, but the stained glass, of course, depicts his, a little bit of his life. So here on the left panel, what you see is St. Vincent finding a little newborn baby left in the street. And actually, they say the baby was left just one block from this church on Rue de la Huchette, uh, uh, very close by. And that used to have a lot of houses of ill repute, we'll say, in the 17th century. And so one of those women abandoned her baby, and Mr. St. Vincent came in and grabbed the baby. Now, the charitable nuns and the organizations were a lot more willing to accept and take care of a baby if it was baptized. So the next panel is him bringing that same baby from the street into this very church, saint Sefran, baptizing it. So that's what's going on there. And then here, this is uh, the same saint, St. Vincent, at the deathbed of Louis XIII, King of France. And that actually happened. This isn't just a fantastical sort of a creation in the mind of the artist. This would have happened. St. Francis would have come to Louis XIII to probably pray, pray with him and read him his last rites. To the left, we have the gentleman in the red cloak. You might think that's Cardinal Richelieu, but it's actually Mazarin, the guy who replaced Richelieu. So that's Mazarin. And then what we've got here is the wife of the, the dying king, Anne of Austria. And at her lap is Louis XIV, the young Louis XIV, who would become the great son king. Now, it's interesting. Louis had a brother. Here's Louis. He's going to become the next king once his dad dies. And he's sort of enveloped in this beautiful blue royal robe with the fleur-de-lis symbol, you know, being caressed by his mom. And then here's the other brother, alone, plain, kind of abandoned and eh, kind of an afterthought. Nobody cares about the brother who's not going to become the king. It's all about Louis. So you can see the interesting difference there visually, right, of how the two brothers are represented.
I don't know if you can make it out in the darkness, but leftover paint job here on the column. All right, folks, I think I'm going to wrap this up. Now, what I'm not tour guiding, I'm trying to explore as best I can and learn about even the spaces that I think I already know. And so what I posted on my blog today, French Fry in Paris, is that a little while ago, this door right here in the darkness in this dark corner, as I was leaving this church the other day, it was open a crack, and there was a spiral staircase leading up all throughout the bell tower, and I decided to go for it and see what was up there. So I actually had a bit of an unexpected and unauthorized trip through that door up to see the bells. In fact, one of them is the oldest bell in Paris, so I encourage you uh, to pop over to my blog. The link is going to be in the description of the replay. This video is going to go up for replay right away. And then my Patreon people, who are supporting me via Patreon, um, got a little bit of extra video content today of my exploration, my secret exploration of that bell tower. All right, so we're going to say goodbye to saint Saint-Saint, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this one. Good t turnout today. All the links you need are in the replay here. You can go back and watch. You can become a supporter of mine on Patreon, help this whole project survive and thrive, get a lot of perks along the way. You can tour with me when you're physically in Paris, and you can follow my f photography and whatnot on Instagram and my blog and all of that. So I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, I'll see you next week for a, another walk through Paris, a different part. For those who are following me on Patreon, you know the drill. We're going to pop over. I'm going to do a second broadcast privately for you. And we're going to have a cafe chat. It's just me, no guests today. I'm going to find a cafe nearby, and we are going to talk about this walk and whatever you feel like discussing. So hope to see you all uh, throughout the week online, and I hope you join me live for the next one. Have a lovely Saturday, and I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.